Joining me now is Robert Clark, a supervisory deputy of the U.S. Marshals Service. He has been involved in this manhunt since the very beginning. He was at the command post today, helping to oversee the team that captured Cavalcante, and he also spoke to Cavalcante today. So I, I very much appreciate your time, Deputy. Let me just uh, start. Welcome back. I mean, the dramatic capture, helicopter, the lightning storm, the police dog, 20 tactical officers. Can you tell me about the moment that you knew you had him? Well, well, thank you for having me again, Aaron. Um, when the call came in over the radio, everyone was just elated. Um, it was a two-week uh, coalition of law enforcement officers that had come together for the common cause of bringing a violent fugitive into custody, and everybody was relieved. Uh, it's been a roller coaster ride the past couple of weeks. I can only imagine, and I know um, you know you had to be be terrified yourself that something horrible could happen. It could end horribly. Something could happen to somebody. That now you you have him in custody. Um, we are hearing that authorities conducted a four-hour interview today with Cavalcante. Uh, you also personally spoke with him. What did you learn? So uh, an interview was conducted with Cavalcante, uh, Deputy U.S. Marshals, Pennsylvania State Police. <clears throat> and county detectives interviewed him. I personally was not present for the interview, uh, but I can tell you what was said, uh, which was relayed to me from our deputy marshals. So uh, essentially everything we thought about Cavalcante and his flight was true. Uh, he was a desperate man. He was actively uh, avoiding apprehension. And uh, shortly after he escaped from the prison, uh, he had hunkered down in an area that was very, very secluded, very, very wooded. And he didn't move for the first couple of days, he said. Uh, he survived on a watermelon that he found at a farm. He drank stream water. Um, he was hiding his fecal matter under um, uh, leaves and foliage so that law enforcement couldn't track him. Uh, he, he was a desperate man. He also described the backpack that he obtained was obtained uh, early uh, in his flight. He had taken it from a residence. Uh, and that's where he obtained a razor. I know a lot of people have talked about how did he get clean, so clean shaven? Did somebody yeah. assist him? Well, quite simply, uh, that razor was in the backpack. So uh, he answered a lot of questions for us. And he also described uh, an increasing amount of law enforcement every day. And that goes for both perimeters. And ultimately, that's why he decided to leave the Longwood Gardens area. He said that on numerous occasions, three times he described that law enforcement officials almost stepped on him within three seven times. or eight yards. Three times. But that just proves to you how thick the vegetation and the foliage was. It was just an immense area to search. Uh, I don't think the public understands how hard it was in extreme heat uh, and extreme conditions to, to locate him. So, you know, it's so much to follow up with you here, Deputy Clark, but this issue with the razor, when you're saying how did people, people wondering how he shaved. So you're literally saying it was just luck that he finds a backpack and there's a razor in the backpack, that that was just luck. You can't make it up, Aaron. We yeah. specifically asked him that question, how did he get clean shaven? And he said there was one in the razor in the backpack that he took. We still don't know the exact place where he took that backpack, nor do we know the exact location that he took the Eagle sweatshirt as well. Right. Okay. So you're still not exactly sure, but obviously it, it sounds like he's admitting he was going in people's homes, whether they were unlocked or there, but he was stealing stuff when he could. Yes, he, he was. He actually uh, said that he was going to steal stuff where there was opportunity. Um, he was a desperate man that was going day to day um, in order just to survive. Uh, an interesting statement he said also was that his end game was to carjack somebody and to head north up to Canada. And he intended to do that in the next 24 hours. He said the law enforcement presence uh, where he was was immense and that he felt that he needed to leave. He had seen the aerial assets we were using. He had seen the helicopters. So uh, that's why he held on to that rifle for so long. And and did he, you, you said that he survived on stream water and watermelon. Did you talk about anything else about how he was able to obtain food? Um, no, it was just the watermelon, mm -hmm. the stream water. Um, we didn't get too much uh, into what else he was eating, um, but we were interested in the part of, about the carjacking and the right. rifle and his intentions and the end game. Did, did he give you, um, did you learn anything more about that rifle? And I know there'd been, you know, whether his, his willingness to use it. No, but we did learn that before he went into that gentleman's house that he had actually surveilled it. And he had said he had surveilled uh, the perimeter where he broke the perimeter at Longwood Gardens for a little while. And he had also surveilled 
uh, the residence where he stole the truck at Dairy Farms. He said when he stole that truck, there were actually two vehicles that were unsecured there. Um, he decided to take one of them and then flee to an area that he knew. So one thing that, you, as you described this, Deputy Clark, that's standing out to me is that he answered the questions, that he seems like he wanted to answer the questions. What was his demeanor like in this interview? I mean, this is a person who was going to be in in prison forever and then he thinks he's going to maybe escape and now he's back to knowing that that's that that he's going he's not going anywhere uh and yet he seems to have answered all the questions that's correct he was under no duress when he answered the questions um there were professional deputy marshals there state troopers he was treated with the utmost professionalism and respect and um he just uh, answered everything that was given to him he had no hesitation we found him to be very truthful and um, everything that we wanted to know, all the gaps in the investigation, the questions that we had uh, and the public had, uh, we were able to get most of the answers from. And did he give you any more details about his actual escape? You know, those images we saw where he's a crab walking or moonwalking backwards up the wall when he gets out. Sure. So uh, we did not question him about the escape. We were more concerned uh, about the flight and the right. fugitive part of the investigation. So. Uh, our deputy marshal did not question about the escape at all. So let me ask you one other thing about, you say, you know, the razor, right? That, that was in the actual backpack, and he's saying he didn't have help. I know today that Lieutenant Colonel Bivens confirmed that Cavacante's sister, right, who they're now moving ahead with deportation procedures, did try to his, uh, assist him about his escape. And when you and I talked last time, uh, you said she was important, but you, you, know, you couldn't d disclose anything at the time, but, uh, but afterwards you, you would be able to. And now, now that, of course, he is captured, uh, are you able to tell us more about how she was helping him or trying to help him? Well, what I can tell you was she was an illegal overstay. Um, there were times where she was less than candid uh, with law enforcement officers. And we believe at the other times she was giving us um, information that was not credible. So rather than pursue obstruction charges, um, we decided to take her out of the equation and she was detained by ICE. It just was too much of our time and resources to look right. into pursuing her criminally. So we just decided to eliminate her from uh, the situation. So in the final moments, and I'm, 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 I'm honing in on something you said that he said in the interview today, that there were three times that law enforcement officers almost stepped on him. You said that they were seven to eight yards away. I mean, that is pretty incredible to, to imagine. And he's lying there hiding. Um, eventually, when this finally uh, was resolved, when, when you got him, uh, it was a dog. It was a canine named Yoda that helped capture uh, Cavalcante. It was crucial, in fact, uh, to all of this. Can you tell us more about the dog, about the dog named Yoda and what the dog did? So I can tell you um, that dog was stationed out of Detroit, Michigan. Uh, he is part of the Bortac tactical team who was stationed out of Michigan. I believe he's three years old. He's a Belgian Malinois, and uh, he was just essential as far as the tracking and the searching, as were numerous other canines that were here. We had other Malinois, we had German Shepherds, uh, we had a Bloodhound. So all these canine resources were utilized from different tactical teams from the area, and they were just an incredible resource. I mean, it's incredible. So what did Yoda actually do? And I, and I again, to remind everybody that at the time when, when he was apprehended, and, and, and Yoda's instrumental in this, Cavalcante has a rifle, I understand, within his possession, within arm's reach. That's correct. So uh, upon the BORTAC officers and the Pennsylvania State Police CERT team closing in on that heat signature Lieutenant Colonel Bivens talked about, yes. um, one of the BORTAC officers physically observed uh, Cavalcante. At that time, verbal commands were given. Cavalcante attempted to flee by slowly pawing away, and the tactical decision made, I'm assuming by BORTAC and the state police, was to deploy that canine. We knew that he was armed, and using... Uh, a canine we felt was a reasonable option before um, upgrading to deadly force. As uh, Yoda moved in on Cavalcante, I believe the only thing showing at the time was Mr. Cavalcante's head or the crown of his head. He ended up taking a bite on the top of his head, which uh, I know uh, a photo has been going out around with a lot of blood. And uh, that's the reason why the blood was there, because he took a bite towards the top of his head. Now, canine is a bite and hold dog. So... There was no holding when you, bits, when you bite someone on the crown of your head. So Cavalcante was again bit in a low extremity area. Uh, Yoda held 
uh, and then Mr. Cavalcanti submitted to the commands and he was taken into custody by an approaching CERT team from the Pennsylvania State Police as well as the Bortac team.